Job market blues. A survey shows areas recruiters are concerned about as the Jamaican job market grows. Weekend Business Report starts right now. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Keneal Gale. Thanks so much for joining us this week. The latest labor market trends and prospects for employment opportunities in Jamaica report published by the Ministry of Labor and Social Security showed that most of the jobs coming on stream now are in the services sector. But as more jobs become available, recruiters are raising some concerns about applicants. We'll have more on that in a bit, but right now let's take a look at some of the top stories BATV News brought you this week. The 2018 second quarter business and consumer confidence indices released on Tuesday showed that even though businesses and consumers believe the economy is growing, they do not believe they're reaping the benefits. The Consumer and Business Confidence Survey was commissioned by the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce. Shana Small tells us more. The latest figures show that consumer confidence increased by 2.7 points, moving from 156.4 points in the first quarter of this year to 159.1 points in the second quarter. But even with this increased confidence, consumers don't believe the growth in the economy is trickling down to them. Consumers have a very positive view of the economy. They believe that current business conditions have improved and expect that this will positively impact their job prospects. It is clear that consumers have a positive view on the economy. The direction they fear the economy appears to be taking and future job prospects. It is nonetheless important to note that while they feel there has been growth in the economy, they do not feel the strict down to them. Consumers also had a positive outlook for job opportunities in the second quarter, with 37% of respondents believing that there are jobs available. Don Anderson, whose company conducted the survey, says he acknowledges that this figure still shows that the large majority of consumers do not believe more jobs will become available or that they will get a job. So they're looking at the economy and they're saying, we see things happening. We believe that job prospects are likely to be better. And we need to know that the lowest index across all of the consumer prospects is in terms of what jobs that person look like. So when we talk about an improvement in job prospects, we're not saying that consumers believe that jobs are going to become available, but that fewer will be negatively about the situation. Said another way, they feel that much is happening around them, but they themselves do not appear to be reaping the Meanwhile, the IMF representative to Jamaica, Dr. Constant Longking, says even though the macroeconomy is growing, social impediments cause the ordinary Jamaican to not feel the effects. Jamaica is on its way to meeting the targets set out by the three-year precautionary standby arrangement with the International Monetary Fund, IMF. That's based on information coming from the Economic Program Oversight Committee, EPOC, in its progress update for the month of June. Javon Keyes has the details. The Jamaican government continues to adhere to all fiscal, monetary policy and financial sector structural benchmarks. That's according to the Economic Program Oversight Committee, EPOC. This is based on the preliminary findings which show that Jamaica is on track to meet the targets for the quantitative performance criteria and the indicative targets for the IMF standby arrangement for the end of June. This, however, with the exception of the inflation target, which had been set at 4% to 6%. EPOC says all seven Microfiscal structural benchmarks were met and all 14 structural benchmarks for public sector transformation, public bodies and public service reform have been met through the end of June 2018. This follows strong fiscal performance in 2017-2018 where Jamaica met all its quantitative and indicative performance criteria. Meanwhile, EPOC notes that the Bank of Jamaica BOJ is continuing in its accommodative stance to loosen monetary policy. This, it says, has been done by lowering the policy rate by 50 basis points to 2% since June 28, 2018. This move was in response to the central bank's projections that inflation will remain below its targeted 46% up to the end of December 2018. Epoch points out that it has supported the BOJ's decision to lower policy rates as it believes the move should stimulate credit expansion and economic growth. In the meantime, with the fiscal space opening up, the central government spent just over $32 billion on social programs for the fiscal year 2017 
in 2018, which ended in March of this year. This was above the target, which was set at $26.6 billion. The Bank of Jamaica is projecting that the inflation for the June 2018 test date will be below the 3.5% to 6.5% range as set out in the Monetary Policy Consultation Clause of the Standby Arrangement. This would trigger a consultation with the IMF's Executive Board, whereby the bank would be required to explain in writing the rationale of the deviation and the planned corrective measures. Epoch says in the midst of the promising fiscal environment, it is very concerned that growth continues to be anemic and in spite of encouraging signs, the program projections are not being met. However, the oversight body continues to be hopeful that this will improve and an agreement will be made with all the remaining stakeholders regarding wages in keeping with Jamaica's legislated 9% wage to GDP fiscal rule for 2018 to 2019. Tourism grew more than 5% for the first half of this year compared to last year. This despite a state of public emergency declared earlier this year in St. James, the island's tourism capital. Here's more. St. James, a parish known for attracting many tourists and home to Jamaica's most active gateway by passenger numbers, the Sangster International Airport. On the dark side, however, the parish has also become a home to major players in the lottery scam. In January, Prime Minister Andrew Holness declared a state of public emergency for the parish of St. James. Negative publicity in the international press later compelled the administration to rebrand the move as enhanced security measures. But even with the more stringent police presence and and restrictions on movement, the Ministry of Tourism is reporting that the sector saw growth. In the first six months of the year, the island's tourism industry grew by 5.4% compared to the same period in 2017. Stopover arrivals increased by 5.9%, bringing the total number of stopover arrivals between January and June to over 1.2 million persons. The number of cruise arrivals also increased by 4.8% compared to the same period in the previous year. Some one 1 million cruise passengers visited the island between January and June. That's 100,000 more tourists than the same time last year. Tourism Minister Edmond Bartlett is attributing this growth to the ministry's deliberate effort to do on-the-ground marketing with key stakeholders around the world. The minister says this helps to counter the effects of the state of public emergency. He says his ministry has been spreading the message of Jamaica's commitment to security and safety. The state of public emergency in St. James has been extended to August 2. In the meantime, the tourism sector earned nearly $1.6 billion in foreign exchange for the period. That's up by 7.3%. The bulk of those earnings came from stopover arrivals, which accounted for over $1.4 billion. Cruise arrivals contributed just over $100 million. More news later, but moving on now, the labor market trends and prospects for employment opportunities in Jamaica reports released a few days ago by the Ministry of Labor and Social Security revealed just where the local job market is heading. The report also saw recruiters sharing some concerns they have about job seekers. The Labor and Social Security Ministry says the aim of the labor market survey is to effectively inform decision making in order to attain productive employment. It should also help individuals make sound career choices as well as influence the creation and the adjustment of educational and training programs to address labor market needs. Figures released by the Statistical Institute of Jamaica Statin indicated that the Jamaican labor force stood at 1,347,600 persons in the last quarter of 2017. The employment rate, which has been trending downwards since 2014, was at 10.4% in the last quarter of 2017. However, youth unemployment was 25.4% for the same period. The report showed that Jamaican workers are mainly engaged in the service sector, which accounted for approximately 68.4% of the employed labor force in the last quarter of 2017. Jamaica's labor force is supplied by graduates from 164 secondary schools, Heart Trust NDA, 40 local colleges and universities. Figures released in 2017 revealed that 34,885 students sat the Caribbean Secondary Examinations Council CSEC examinations during the year. However, only 8,703 or 24.9% attained five or more subjects including mathematics and English language which would allow them to matriculate into the working world. 
Data from 40 tertiary institutions indicated that 17,222 persons graduated in 2017. Females accounted for 67.3% of the total output. Over 28% of the graduates pursued courses to obtain jobs as managers or administrators. The government of Jamaica has identified several growth sectors to generate employment opportunities. These include business process outsourcing BPO, tourism, animation and film, construction, manufacturing, energy and mining. Growth in the BPO sector has been facilitated mainly by advances in information and communication technology, ICT. According to Jampro, the BPO sector is a high-performing segment of Jamaica's services industries. It has enjoyed the highest employment growth rate of any sector in the last decade and presently accounts for more than 26,000 employees in over 60 companies across the island. Jobs in tourism are also increasing on the island. For 2017, there was continued demand for travel to the Caribbean region with Jamaica welcoming over 4.3 million visitors. This represented an increase of 13.2% over 2016. Tourism is one of the core drivers of economic development in Jamaica and a major contributor to gross domestic product GDP. Some of the job opportunities in the industry include bar staff, consumer service personnel, kitchen assistants, business managers, and restaurant staff. Meanwhile, the health and wellness tourism industry is an emerging area on which Jampa has placed some focus in a bid to bring more job opportunities to the island. In the meantime, Jamaica is globally recognized as one of the most naturally attractive locations for filming and as such, overseas filmmakers have been coming to the island for decades. In 2018, Jampers Film Commission will focus on creating more jobs for Jamaicans working in the screen-based industries. The potential job opportunities will include script writers, story editors, costume designers, visual effects producers and makeup artists. Construction is also booming on the island and a significant amount of job opportunities will be in this field. The boom is expected to continue for the next few years, providing jobs for civil engineers, structural engineers, skilled manual laborers, electricians, quantity surveyors, site managers and others. Meanwhile, the National Labor Market Survey of 2017 investigated the types of difficulty employers faced when seeking to hire staff. Lack of work experience was the leading response, with 32% of respondents saying that was their major challenge. 26% said applicants were underqualified, while 20% said interviewees gave a bad impression, and 18% thought applicants' compensation demands were an issue. The Minister of Labor report said as job markets become increasingly competitive and the availability of skills grow more diverse, recruiters need to be more selective in their choices, given that poor recruiting decisions can produce long-term negative effects. The survey also showed that some of the attributes employers look for when hiring new staff include knowledge and skills specific to the position, persons who are responsible and committed, and prior work experience. The report ended by giving some recommendations to help better prepare the labor force for the local job market. These included the use of the national BPO coordinator to understand the BPO sector and find innovative ways to maximize opportunities while adding more value to the sector. The country should not focus solely on call center jobs in the BPO sector, but also on higher end jobs such as legal and medical processing outsourcing. Jamaica should invest more in human capital in order to increase skill transfer and succession planning. There should also be collaboration between companies and institutions so that graduates will be equipped with the necessary skills required in the workplace. It was also recommended that persons in the tourism sector receive official training with more time dedicated to classroom sessions and experiential training. There must also be a partnership between the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security and the relevant stakeholders to give youths an opportunity to develop their soft skills while getting the necessary work experience. Company news comes up next, then later as one World Cup ends, preparations are on in earnest for another. Amputees in Nigeria prepare for their turn on the global stage. More WBR after this break. Welcome back to Weekend Business Report. Here's this week's company news. 
Indus Pharma Jamaica Limited opened its initial public offering IPO on Thursday. The Montego Bay-based pharmaceutical company is expecting to raise almost $400 million from the shares being offered. The company says the money raised will be used to expand the business, the distribution network and the number of products in its portfolio. GK Capital Management is leading the transaction, playing the double roles of Leader Ranger and co-broker. Sagico Investments has been engaged as the other co-broker. Creamy says the 2018 first quarter results for the period ending May 2018 saw revenue increasing by $93 million or 29%. The company says the revenue jump was attributed to increased product supply as a result of greater production efficiencies along with the introduction of a new range of novelties which are performing well in the market. This coupled with the new sales and marketing thrust to expand the company's market penetration and top of mind awareness of its product range has resulted in a successful quarter. Let's now take a look at the closing numbers from the major stock markets around the world. When we come back, more of the week's top stories from the Beer TV News Desk. Stay with us. Welcome back to Weekend Business Report. More news now. Petra Jam's general manager, Floyd Grinley, is out. The embattled general manager tendered his resignation amidst allegations of mismanagement and several policy breaches at the state-owned oil refinery. The announcement was made by Prime Minister Andrew Holness, who gave the final report from the investigations done by the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology in Parliament on Tuesday. Here's Jamila Maitland. The announcement comes days after Petrojam employees protested outside the oil refinery. Placards in hands hiding their faces, the employees called for the resignations of the general manager and the human resources manager. Now the Prime Minister says Petrojam is in urgent need of a complete strategic review after revealing the findings from the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology-led investigation. Addressing issues of donations, travel and appointment, Mr. Holness outlined several new policies and amendment to policies to prevent the same issues from happening again. The Ministry of Finance must establish a ceiling for donations under which the board approves. So there must be a ceiling, whether it is going to be 100,000, 50,000, but there must be a ceiling that the board approves. The Ministry must establish the number of times a single applicant may benefit. So if you have a ceiling, you could still breach the ceiling by applicants coming over and over again. So we have to set a limit to the number of times an applicant can benefit within a budget cycle. The Ministry of Finance must establish uniformed application and approval processes, which include requirements for the disclosure of connected party relations. He said that way, there will be no room for issues concerning transparency. Mr. Holness pointed out that unlike other public bodies, Petrojam is a self-financing government agency which needs tailored procedures to ensure its effective management. He added that the inclusion of a representative from the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica, PCJ, Petrojam's parent company, to the board may help to monitor the organization. So, Mr. Speaker, in a situation like this, for example, we should have a member from the PCJ board sitting on the Petrojam board. 
And that's that's what I'm saying. So that that this is something based upon the review that we have found as a weakness that we really need to correct that. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister said the Auditor General's report will reveal more details which will form the basis for more decisions. Whatever issues are raised, the government will act to address them. This government has nothing to hide and we are not shielding anyone and we are not covering up anything. We want to get, we want to get at the truth. Former Acting Chief Engineer at National Energy Solutions, Lawrence Pommels, who's been charged with money laundering, was a signatory to the state-owned energy company's financial accounts in the days leading up to his arrest. The worrying information was revealed during a sitting of Parliament's Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on Wednesday. More in this report. Managing Director at Nisol, Carolyn Warren, revealed that seven months after the Chief Engineer Anthony Brown returned from vacation, Mr. Pommels was still signing on the company's financial records, including checks. PAAC members questioned the management's decision to have Mr. Pommel remain as a signatory. Given that Mr. Pommels was only inserted on a temporary basis, given the return of the Chief Engineer, why did he why did he continue as a signing officer? That's one. And two, what was the extent of his signing function thereafter the return of the chief engineer? And third question, did he continue signing up to the time of his arrest? Mrs. Warren explained that he was added as a signatory in March to continue the operations of several ongoing projects and has not been removed since. Why would you maintain uh, the additional signatory to your, to your accounts? It was taken to the board. The board was the one who made the decision that he be added. And unfortunately, it was not done in time. It was not done. He was not removed. She added that Mr. Pommels was not able to authorize a check on his own, but PAAC members were still concerned about potential mismanagement. Of importance was the $50 million street lighting installation, loss reduction, and community renewal silk program, which was headed by Mr. Pommel. PAAC members questioned the number of projects completed during his tenure and the amount of money dispersed, as well as the method. What is the spend going through and projects going through Mr. Pommels compared to that would have gone through the office of the chief engineer? I do not have that information because it wasn't asked for. I will um, go and get it and get back to you on that. PAC members have requested an internal audit of the work done during Mr. Pommel's tenure. Meanwhile, the police are continuing their own investigation into the former chief engineer. The Jamaica Special Economic Zones Authority was officially opened on Wednesday. It's expected to help Jamaica become a major player in international commerce. Javon Keys was there. A Special Economic Zone, SEZ, is a geographic business area where local and international investors apply to have their businesses established. There are many benefits to setting up shop in an SEZ. Chairman of the Special Economic Zone Authority, Metri Siaga, says the establishment of the authority will see a more reciprocal relationship between the government and the companies in the zones. He says there is already a vast amount of investments in the zones and he expects that to continue trending upwards along with a wide range of jobs. We have underground over 500 million US dollars in investments and over 5,000 jobs in special economic zones. And though I don't like making predictions, it is anticipated that when fully mature, the SEZ landscape will boast many billions in investment and hundreds of thousands of jobs. And those jobs will be created in a range of sectors including manufacturing, logistics, BPO, and others too numerous to mention. He also notes that the move from free zones to special economic zones brings benefits for companies which make local purchases. Under the free zone, there was no incentive to purchase locally. Under the new SEZ, local purchases are exempt from GCT. In the meantime, CEO of the Special Economic Zones Authority, Dr. Eric Deans, says a number of agencies are providing funding for the SEZs. There's also an MOU with the authority in Singapore. Jamaica is receiving support for the SEZ regime and the Global Logistics Hub Initiative from the World Bank, from the IDB, 
CDB, our local development bank, and other multilateral institutions. We are now in the process of finalizing a bilateral technical cooperation agreement with Singapore, and we have conducted both inward and outward missions to that country that has welcomed the Jamaican partnership to develop SEZs using their experience and expertise. There are currently 104 free zones and special economic zones across 126 locations island-wide. There are also 100 potential investors, including local and international players. The authority currently has 40 applications for entities recognized as SEZs. Seven have already been approved. When we come back from one World Cup to another, amputees in Nigeria are looking to go all the way. More WBR after this break. Welcome back to Weekend Business Report. Nigerian athletes are preparing for the Amputee Football World Cup in October. The team is optimistic that they will do better than the Super Eagles did in Russia. Emmanuel Iberwuchi is the captain of Nigeria's national football amputee team. He lost a leg 16 years ago in a road accident and only started playing football after his leg was amputated. He's confident Nigeria will win the next Amputee Football World Cup. Today now, we are planning for the World Cup, the biggest tournament in the world. And we are very grateful and we are glad and we are happy that Nigeria, we are going for the tournament. Not even only going, I believe we are going there to win the cup home. The team's coach says his squad will do better than Nigeria at the Russian World Cup this year. They failed to qualify from the group stage. We are putting in them that they, can, they, are, they, will see, they should see themselves as equally good as a normal, uh, you know, an, an enabled person. And they know they can, they can do that. So since then, all of them, they have the confidence now that they can even do better than the able body. Nigeria won eight gold medals at the 2016 Paralympics and finished top in the medal table among African countries. Now they hope to clinch the Amputee Football World Cup that will take place in Mexico in three months' time. And that's our show for this week. On behalf of the entire Weekend Business Report team, I'm Camille. See you next time.